Welcome back everyone to Nerd of the Rings. We're ready to dive into season two, episode four of The Rings of Power. The episode entitled Eldest features a lot of cameos and references for us to break down, including the live action debut of a huge fan favorite character. But first we should start at the beginning of the episode. Real quick though, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss these breakdowns and my weekly dives into the lore of Middle Earth. We're back at the Grey Havens where we see some elven soldiers marching in a shot that was in the latest trailer before the season got underway, and we jump right into a conversation between Elrond and Galadriel. Elrond says he trusts Galadriel can recommend an archer and a couple swordsmen, and Galadriel shoots back about whether Elrond is sure that he can trust her, and Elrond is like, fine, stay here if you'd rather. Galadriel ends up caving and has a few people to recommend. Next up, we get something that I felt was sorely missing in a lot of season one, something to help avoid that feeling of fast travel. We get a few shots of the elf company traveling through various landscapes, followed by a nice little map transition showing the company coming to a bridge. We can see this river on the map, which is at this time known as the Baranduin, meaning golden brown river. Fans of the books and films will more commonly know this river by the name Brandywine. The lake pictured toward the top of the image is Lake Evendim. In the books, this is actually where Galadriel and her husband Celeborn lived for many years in the early Second Age, before moving to Eregion in the year 750. Okay, typical me going way too deep on the maps for a moment. As for the bridge, I tried to pinpoint it by overlapping the map that was released early on when Rings of Power was announced, and it doesn't exactly line up. Partially because of the skewed angle here, but it does seem this bridge falls within the Old Forest. I don't think it's the same location as the later Brandywine Bridge, which is on a part of the river where it crosses directly east and west. This one is pointed much more northeast because of the angle of the river, which makes me think it's further south. They do mention going south for the route they end up taking, but judging by the map, I was thinking these might be the Barrow Downs here, which is actually to the north of the bridge being shown, so I'm a little bit lost on this one. Geography nerdery aside, Elrond and Galadriel come to the bridge which has been destroyed by lightning, which Galadriel points out must have been the work of Sauron. Elrond calls up the cartographer of the group, Chemnir, who gives the travel options. Galadriel gets a vision of the soon to be seen Barrowites, and says there is evil that dwells in those hills. Still, Elrond says they're going south, and again, we see him kind of put Galadriel in her place as her superior officer once again. Definitely some testiness going on between these two. Elrond drops the word meno, which is go in Neo Sindarin. Real quick on the wide shot of the broken bridge here, I was like, holy crap, this is a crazy huge ravine so close to an area that we know pretty well. However, I wonder if the water level for some of these rivers could actually change at a key point in a future season. I won't spoil it for people unfamiliar, but I will just say water displacement definitely has an impact on Middle Earth in the Second Age. Elrond and Galadriel continue their sass contest, Elrond saying they won't take counsel from her trinket, meaning her ring, Nenya. And Galadriel says she stays on the trip because she doesn't want anyone to get killed, including Elrond. Real quick, I mentioned this about the trailer before, but I really like Galadriel's hairstyle here. It's a bit of a nod to Tolkien's quote saying Galadriel was then of Amazon disposition and bound up her hair as a crown when taking part in athletic feats. Real quick, looking at the map once again, we can see how far they've gone so far, with the Grey Havens labeled here in its Cinderin elvish name, Mithlond. Elrond says earlier that Eregion is just under 150 leagues from the Grey Havens which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 miles. And yes, I did go consult Karen Wynne Fonstadt's Atlas of Middle-Earth and confirm this is pretty dead on with the measurements there, which is pretty cool. I don't know if it's the angle of this map or what, but it seems really condensed to me on the eastern half especially. Eregion doesn't seem as wide as it should be, and the Brandywine, Bruinen, and Misty Mountains all seem closer to each other than they should be. Anyway, second geography nerd tangent aside, we next catch up with the stranger, who discovers a goat which leads him to the debut of fan favorite book character, Tom Bombadil. Now, I've got some thoughts on Jolly Tom so far, but I'll save those till a bit later in the episode, after we talk a bit more about his appearances. 
We hear him murmuring his Jolly Tom song and showing off a bit of his irreverence in his answers to the stranger, saying they're stars above most hills when the wizard mentions looking for the stars above Tom's. They're interrupted as the stranger's star chart blows away, getting hooked on a tree. He sees a nice branch and thinks this would make a nice staff, and gets sucked in by the tree like the hobbits with Old Man Willow in the books. And next we are with the Harfoots, who did not die in the Sand Twister in episode two. They come across another hobbit, this one of the store variety. He says his name is Merrimack. In the books, there's a Merrimack Brandybuck who is Mary's uncle. And while all the hobbit breeds would intermingle, the Brandybucks were known to have storish characteristics. So 80s hairband guy and Poppy make googly eyes and they're off to meet the stores. And the Harfoots, Nori and Poppy, are blown away by the stores living in holes. So presumably this is where this iconic characteristic of the hobbits will come from in the show. Quick note, in the books, it's actually the Harfoots who originated the practice of living in holes, which they called smiles. That's S-M-I-A-L-S. -S. The store leader is called Gundabel. And like Gollum's grandmother for the stores of the Gladden Fields many centuries later, she is the matriarch of their people. She hears of their stranger friend being a wizard and kind of freaks out because they know of a dark wizard, who we then go to visit. Now real quick, last week I forgot to mention the name of the dark wizard's dwelling, Karas Gair, which means City of Dread. Though Gair could also be read as sea. But since we don't see the Sea of Helkar or any other body of water, and given that he's known as the Dark Wizard, I'm guessing Dread is the smart bet here. Helmet Guy is reporting back to the Dark Wizard that the other wizard is heading toward the Hermit, and that the hobbits won't escape them for long. The wizard refers to him as Gaudrim, which likely translates from Sindarin to machine people or device people. Perhaps this is a reference to their helmets that they don't seem to ever remove, which make them look less human. The Dark Wizard tells him to concentrate his search on the Harfoots, and that he will see to the Istar himself. Back with said nameless Istar, he's still stuck in the tree until Tom comes along, and we get some iconic Bombadil book lines where Tom rescues the stranger, telling the tree he shouldn't be waking and to eat earth, dig deep, and drink water. This is lifted straight from the page where Tom rescues the hobbits from Old Man Willow in the Old Forest. This will likely feel familiar even to non-book readers as it was also repurposed in the Peter Jackson films. In the extended edition of The Two Towers, Treebeard gets Tom's lines when Merry and Pippin are sucked in by a tree in Fangorn Forest. The stranger finally asks Tom who he is, and Tom references the Withywindle, the river that flows through the Old Forest where Tom and Goldberry live. Super minor tweak here, but Tom says it's the name of what people call him back in the Withywindle, which sounds a bit odd given it's the name of the river and not the forest itself. Also, this is super random, but it's kind of how my brain works sometimes. I chuckled a bit given that Rory Kinnear is in the recent James Bond movies, and he introduces himself as Bombadil, Tom Bombadil. The stranger then gets a bath in Bombadil's house and we hear Goldberry singing along with Tom. Now this was a really odd thing that I didn't understand. The stranger asks about Goldberry being there and Tom acts like it's odd that he would ask and that they're actually alone. Given we just heard Tom telling Goldberry not to be bashful, I really don't know what to make of this. That aside, I really like Tom's reaction to the stranger asking him if someone was there with him. Tom's, you're here, I think you are, aren't you? And the stranger's subsequent confusion was a pretty great moment of Tom's levity and wit. Next they chat a bit by the fire and Tom talks about the stars being newcomers and how one minute it was all dark and the next the stars were there. He also refers to himself as Eldest, as he is referred to in the books. In fact, his elvish name is Earwain Ben Adar, meaning oldest and fatherless. To give some context as to how old Tom is talking about being here, the stars are created by the Vala Varda far back in ancient days before the awakening of the first elves so that they would not awaken in a world of darkness. Tom's next several lines are pulled directly from an exchange he has with Frodo, asking who Frodo is and giving us a glimpse of how old he is. Though this version cuts out references to things like Barrow Whites, the Kings of Arnor, the Big People, the Migration of the Elves, and Morgoth. Tom then refers to the tree as Old Man Ironwood, again clearly a riff on Old Man Willow from the Old Forest in the books. 
Again, Tom's bit about each thing belonging to itself is also pulled from those early chapters of Fellowship of the Ring. And I gotta say, it is fun to hear those lines play out in an adaptation. Tom then makes an allusion to names belonging to people, which strikes a chord because Stranger doesn't know his name. And this is kind of the moment where my hopes for him being a blue wizard took its biggest hit yet. There's been enough references thus far this season to this guy's name that I can't help but feel they're working towards some big and likely drawn out reveal that his name is Gandalf. Last week, I totally missed Nori's calling the staff in his dreams a gand, which is derived from the old Norse word G-A-N-D-R, meaning wand or staff. The name Gandalf, which is given to him by the men of Arnor, translates in world to wand elf. So I'm kind of expecting that's the way this name is going to play out. We'll see how it goes, but I've kind of made it clear where I stand on the Blue Wizard versus Gandalf thing, so we'll let that bridge be struck by lightning when we come to it. We hear some horses approaching and Tom gives us the lowdown on the Dark Wizard, and man, I'm starting to wish these guys would just have proper names already. People just ominously saying the Dark Wizard for a character we've seen multiple times and Stranger for a character we've spent a season and a half with just feels like it's robbing some of these moments of some luster. Even if they are names that casual fans won't recognize, labeling them as something other than Good Wizard and Bad Wizard would be nice to feel some attachment to these characters, I think. At this point, I kind of feel like my hand is forced and I'm just gonna start calling the Dark Wizard Aberforth. Tom and the Stranger talk about the danger of Sauron and Aberforth joining forces. Tom reveals to the Stranger, yep, your task is to face the big bad guys, so buckle up, buttercup. We then return to Elrond's company as they come to the Barrow Downs. Now much has been made of the existence of Barrowites here in the Second Age, which predates their origin in the books by the work of the Witch King. The Barrow Downs themselves, however, do predate even the beginning of the Second Age. We are told in the books that the ancestors of the Edine built these burial mounds prior to migrating to Beleriand in the late First Age. This could also explain the more Eastern inspired design of the Barrow Whites we see here, as they are meant to be the bodies of fallen men who had recently migrated from the far east of Middle-earth. Presumably what the show is going with here is that Sauron came by the Barrow Downs and awakened the creatures known as Barrow Whites. It's a little nebulous on whether he simply reawakened them or created them at this time. Galadriel seems to immediately recognize them as Barrow Whites when the others ask what they are, which either implies she has come across these somewhere else or they knew these creatures existed in this location. Presumably, if it were the latter, the topic would have come up sooner than when they were attacked though. We hear some really creepy whispers which are saying the incantation sung by the Barrow Whites who trapped the hobbits in the books. I believe we can make out cold be hand and heart and bone and cold be sleep under stone. Again, this might be slightly familiar to movie fans as they use the opening line and one from the middle, albeit modified, for Gollum's poem he recites in the two towers. Cold be heart and hand and bone, cold be travelers far from home. Elrond discovers the bodies of the messengers Gilgalad sent which we saw dragged by chains in a previous episode. I was kind of surprised that the letter was there with the bodies, as it was notably left behind as the camera zoomed in on it last we saw them. I'm curious, do you all think this is a continuity error, or are we meant to think the Barrow Whites retrieved the letter after dragging away the bodies? Next up, it's a small thing, but something I appreciate is the tinkling we can hear of small bits of metal, which goes with the books where they're described as having gold rings rattling on their bony fingers. As expected, we get the Elf Avengers assemble shot and they soon discover their weapons don't harm the Whites. Elrond ends up grabbing weapons out of the Barrow. He learned from lore that only the blades they are buried with will return them to death. I do appreciate the idea that Elrond probably learned this from reading books of lore. Way to nerd out, Elrond. This likely explains how Galadriel knew about them as well. At this point, it definitely seems Barrow Whites are a more widespread concept in this adaptation rather than unique to the Barrow Downs of Eriador. As for the sword lore, that is something original to the show. There is some minor inspiration I could see here from the books, as it is the Barrow Blades that the Hobbits take on their adventures. These blades were made by Arnorians when they fought wars against the Witch King, and it's one of these blades Merry uses to stab him in the leg before Eowyn lands her killing blow. As I said throughout the marketing for season two, I love the look of the Barrow Whites. They're creepy as heck and the glowing eyes look fantastic. 
Honestly, my biggest complaint about this scene is just how short it is. It feels much more like a cameo for the Barrow Whites than them being a big feature in this episode. The flying chains felt a little bit odd to me, just because I feel like I've seen similar things in other films, and it felt less like an enchantment and freezing touch that causes the hobbits to lose consciousness in the books. Before we move on from the Barrow Whites, I gotta point out some nerdy etymology element here. The elves refer to the place they must travel as Tirn Gorthad, and I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit at the elves being surprised by the Barrow Whites while using this name for the Barrow Downs, an elvish phrase translating to Burial Mound of Wraiths or Spirit of the Dead. I feel like maybe they should have seen this coming. It would kind of be like going to a place called Dangerwood and being like, holy crap, there's danger in this woods. Next, we catch up with a seal door and a rondeer who find the attacked camp with weapons and flower petals left behind. A rondeer then finds the gruesome remains of people attacked and killed by the Ents. Estrid tells a rondeer they should check the forest north because, trust me bro, and they resolve to head out but a rondeer is suspicious. And after a seal door gets in another humble brag about the indoor plumbing in Numenor, a rondeer confronts Estrid, revealing that she has a concealed Adar brand. Her possible treachery revealed the two heroes take Estrid with them in hand shackles to lead them north through a swampy land. After a seal door falls in the mud, a rondeer and he are about to die in the swamp of sadness, but Estrid does the good guy thing and puts in a stick trying to save them. Turns out there's a big old bug worm thing that's about to take out Estrid when Arondir stabs it and kills it. Arondir says there are nameless things in the deep places of the world. Apparently this one ventured to more shallow places as we're kind of at ground level here. The nameless things are mentioned by Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings after he returns as Gandalf the White. Far, far below the deepest delving of the dwarves, the world is gnawed by nameless things. Even Sauron knows them not. They are older than he. Now I have walked there, but I will bring no report to darken the light of day. We even see that the Balrog is freaked out by the nameless things deep below Moria, as he's in quite a hurry to leave. One likely example of such a creature is the Watcher in the Water, which the Fellowship encounters outside the doors of Durin, though it's just not exactly nameless. We don't really know how varied these creatures were or any real details about them. They're just very chilling reminders of the horrors that lie in the depths of Middle-earth. Back in Storville, the hobbits bond over their heartless treatment of their own kind, but when the matriarch discovers their leader's last name was Burroughs, she shows Sadok Ancestor's mood board describing his vision of a place with rolling hills where they could dig holes and live in them in less than a month. This ancestor of Sadok, who presumably founded the Harfoots, called this place the Suzat, which is a pretty deep cut reference, but this is the actual Westron name for the Shire. I can't help but think this is the show telling us exactly where the entire Hobbit storyline is going over the next three seasons. They're probably gonna end up founding the Shire. Whether that will have the Arnor connection in the books, it's hard to say at this point. But if I had to bet, I think they'll probably skip over that and just have the hobbits come to Eriador for some reason or another. Also, I totally missed this at first, but when they're talking about their wizard friend, they compare him to a giant and an elf, and the goond calls him a grand elf. So yeah, what it feels like we have here is another situation where we're gonna talk around a thing before landing on the thing. Nori using the phrase gand, now calling him a grand elf, it's starting to feel like in season one where they were like, oh, we need a magic object that's circular. Oh, we'll do a crown. Oh, now we'll make two and they'll be smaller. Oh, now we'll do three and they'll be rings. Except this one is kind of shaping up to take place over the entire season. Now this ancestor of Sadox was called Rorimus, which seems to be a bit of a mixture of Hobbit naming conventions, but the closest would be Rorimac Brandybuck, the father of the previously mentioned Merrimack. Rorimac is actually the first person who adopts Frodo after his parents' death. It's only after a number of years that he goes to live with Bilbo in Bag End. Goldenface shows up and smacks the matriarch around before threatening them so that they'll turn in the Harfoots, but the Gund keeps them secret. Fun fact, I don't think this is related, but it's still kind of fun. Gundu in Dwarvish means underground hall and is possibly an element of the name Gundabad. 
Now there's no reason hobbits here would understand Dwarvish, or for this to be an actual connection, but a chance to nerd out on Kuzduel and other languages is always good fun. Next, we are on to Galadriel and Elrond talking about the ring. Elrond still isn't sold on the whole rings thing, and Galadriel feels it may be their only way to win against Sauron. I'm very curious to see how this all plays out. They seem to kind of be talking around the rings almost being the lesser of two evils, and them being the only hope of defeating Sauron. I'll be curious to see what happens when Sauron creates the One, and the elves are no longer able to use their rings anymore. Will this rob them of what Galadriel thinks is their greatest, I guess, weapon? Or will it become a ring versus ring kind of thing? The former would certainly be more true to the book version. Personally, I hope they don't go too far down the track of the rings being offensive weapons in the way that the One is sometimes seen as. Galadriel gets another foresight vision, First, we see an image of Sauron's crown, likely from a duel with Sauron that was teased in the last trailer. We then see Elrond banged up and bloodied with a knife held to his throat by orcs. We then get a super quick shot of orcs pulling down the statue of Feanor in a region as they ransack the town square type area. This has kind of a cool lead in to Celebrimbor's falling in the same direction, making a parallel between his grandfather's statue falling and the elven smith himself. The final shot is of a halbrandish looking Sauron looking down towards someone with blonde hair. I thought this might be Galadriel, but unless they're on a slope, she seems a lot shorter here. So perhaps this could be another vision that Sauron will make Galadriel experience, where she's briefly her younger self like we saw in season one. Galadriel snaps out of the vision and asks Elrond to promise that he'll put defeating Sauron above all else, including her own life. Elrond is like, I'm not making any promises coming from that dang ring, but yes, I'll totally take down Sauron and let you die if it comes to it. Really sweet best friend kind of stuff. They're interrupted by Map Man because they've heard drums and we cut back to a Rondir and Isildur. Isildur lets Estrid loose from her manacles and he's like, maybe it's smoochy kiss time. But Estrid draws a sword and a Rondir draws his bow. Isildur gets over his total failure of putting the moves on and promises Estrid he won't allow the people to cast her out. All of a sudden, a flowery Entwife shows up and bark slaps Estrid into a boulder. Arondir intervenes and says he's of the Greenwood. Now, I think he's referring here to Osiriand rather than Greenwood the Great in Rovanion, which we later know as Mirkwood. In season one, Arondir said he was from Balerion. And we do find elves in the land of Osiriand who come to be known as green elves because their clothing was the color of leaves. The Entwife responds by asking if he has ever touched ax to wood in his life, which I have to say is a pretty steep prerequisite for not dying. Now in the books, we find the Ents are created to protect the forest. They are the shepherds of the trees. I think this particular Ent has a bit of PTSD going on. She obviously seems a bit intense, and doesn't seem to acknowledge that living beings, even elves, need wood to create things like their houses. This much is said in the Silmarillion when Yavanna and Aule, the creators of the trees and dwarves respectively, make the points that living beings need wood, but living beings also pose a threat for wanton destruction. The Ents are made in order to protect against such abuse of the trees. This is why the treachery of Saruman to Treebeard and the Ents is so great. It's far beyond what he would need to simply feed the fires of Orthanc for warmth or other practical needs. We then see a male Ent join the party, who talks about an army of orcs marching and murdering, Adar's orcs marching toward Eregion. I really like this next moment though between Arondir and the Ent wife. The moment of his sorrow at destroying a great tree in season one coming back to mind as he asks forgiveness of an Ent wife here. I think it's a really nice moment. The Entwife does say forgiveness takes an age, so I guess it's good that Arondir is an elf. Sorry if you ever cut down a tree, Isildur, you ain't getting forgiven before you keel over, my guy. The Ents refer to tending this forest since before the mountains rose up to divide it, which like Tom Bombadil gives us a hint of just how ancient these beings are. The mountains are created by Morgoth during the years of the trees in an effort to hinder the Vala Orome as he would hunt the evil creatures of the world. In these ancient days, they were even taller than we see them now. And when the elves would make their great journey westward, it would lead some to abandon the migration. Arondir reunites with Theo and they give each other a hug, which is nice. I'm glad they're seemingly back on good terms. 
We'll see if it lasts or if this will be a recurring issue between them. Isildur goes to Estrid, who wakes up to be reunited with her betrothed, and as soon as I saw the dude from the Wild Men camp come up, I was like, seriously, that guy? And like, I know they've probably known each other for what, like 12 hours maybe? But I gotta say, I'm kind of rooting for Isildur to win the girl, so to speak here. I don't know, I think Isildur here seems like the kind of guy who leaps with his heart. And he comes across as a genuine good dude, so why not root for him? Arondir says he's got to go track down the orcs heading north and says Theo can go as well. Theo says he has his own promises to keep, and I wonder if this is him being the healer of the people of Pelargir, or if he maybe made some promises to the wild men. I know a popular theory is that Theo will become a Nazgul, and I could have seen him growing close to Arondir, then perhaps Arondir dying, and that being a huge push toward him turning to evil, having essentially lost two parents. So I'm really curious where that story will go from here. A quick geography note, we know the orcs are heading north, and we know Arondir and Isildur are somewhere north of Pelargir. It didn't feel to me that they were traveling all that far, However, based on the upcoming map shot, it's clear Adar and company are indeed traveling the lands that will one day be Rohan, on the east side of the White Mountains, not the west. So in all likelihood, Isildur and Arondir could very well be in what will later be known as the Druidan Forest. We can see in the map shot that there's much more woods connected to Fangorn Forest here, with forests stretching all across Rohan. Fangorn itself is even listed on the map, Toward the beginning of the shot, we can also see the Emin Muil, where Sam and Frodo meet Gollum, and the lake Nenhithoel, where the Gondorians will one day build the Argonath, the great statues of Isildur and, in the books, his brother Anarion. Now, at the tail end of the shot, we see the Orc Trail arrive in Eregion, so they're getting really close to Celebrimbor's realm. And as we see Elrond, Galadriel, and the team encounter the orcs, so we can safely assume they've also entered the realm of Eregion. The question is, how far are they from the actual capital city of Austin Ethel? We haven't seen it called such in the show yet, but there is clearly a distinction between the realm and the city as evidenced by the map. Elrond says word has to get back to Gilgalad before their hosts set sail for Mordor, because there won't be anyone there for them to attack, which would be pretty not great. Some orcs shoot at a horse, which they miss completely, but they manage to hit Cartographer Elf in the stomach. And here we get what was undoubtedly the moment in the episode that made me just stop and say, what? Galadriel has unlocked her Jedi force healing apparently, as holding her hand on the wound makes the arrow fall out, and the dude is like completely right as rain instantly. It kind of makes you think, man, Elrond was really slacking when he heals Frodo of the Morgul knife wound. It took the Hobbit a full day to wake up and he wasn't even fully healed. Your mileage may vary on this, but for me this just really took me out of the moment, as it felt like it went beyond the bounds of increasing an elf's abilities and went into the realm of granting godlike powers. Galadriel gives Ninya to Elrond, telling him to go back to Linden to warn Gilgalad. She then goes on to take on the orcs single-handedly with some sweet-looking throwing daggers and does the cool trailer move where she swipes arrows through a falling torch and then shoots them at the orcs. And I know some folks will complain about how the arrows kind of explode, but stuff like that doesn't really bother me. It's cool fighting stuff that looks cool. Game on. And I think this scene does something a lot better than other films and TV in that it actually shows Galadriel doing some things that would make orcs pause and not immediately overwhelm her, after she gets on the horse and is stationary for a few moments. It's kind of a prevalent thing for the bad guys to take turns fighting heroes, and she's at least swinging around this chain thing that would give orcs some pause. Back with Elrond and team, one elf says Galadriel sacrificed herself to save them all, and Elrond responds, no, she did it to save the ring. Which, to be fair, it can be two things. The next thing that really jumped out at me is Galadriel yelling to the orcs, go back to the shadow. In all likelihood, this is a different context than what Gandalf is referring to when he says these exact words to the Balrog. I suppose it also works here as its own phrase, telling them to go back to Mordor. But this moment really just serves to remind me of the original source of the line, which has a much deeper meaning than a mere location. Adar grabs Galadriel's arrow as she's about to fire it and says, Elen sila lumen, omen tielvo. This phrase and its translation actually comes from Fellowship of the Ring, as Frodo says it to Gildor, showing the elves he knows some of their language. 
And with that, Galadriel is presumably captured by Adar and the orcs, and we are officially halfway through the season. I gotta say, I definitely feel this was the weakest of the episodes of season two so far. Now, this is just my two cents, and you can totally disagree with me here, and that's totally cool. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode and the season so far in the comments. For me, episodes one through three felt like an obvious improvement over season one, and I found myself getting more invested in certain parts and looking forward to the next episode. Episode four, I think, is more reminiscent of season one's shortcomings. It feels like there are too many stories happening and you really feel the absence of Casa Doom and the Anatar storylines in particular, which are easily my favorites so far. It was really cool to see Tom Bombadil in live action, and I didn't expect him to be just like the books. They're throwing him in a new area with a made up wizard story and gave us a heads up that he's like 10% more interventionist in this tale. And I'm good with that. It makes sense to tweak for the medium a bit. That being said, I think this guy just needs his jolly level turned up by like a good 50%. Him kind of sort of murmuring the songs and seeming ever so slightly quirky, but kind of wizard like just isn't hitting the way I'd like Tom to hit. It sure seems he'll be in more episodes this season, so we'll see how things go. But I'm definitely looking for more of Jolly Tom than moderately content Tom. I think you can definitely see the potential in Kinnear's performance, the warmth, the irreverence. They're there, it's just not been allowed to shine so far in a way that feels like this character can only be Tom Bombadil. Right now it feels as though they're kind of scared to let him fully be that character. Next, apologies to those who love hobbits in the show, but I just can't for the life of me care about these characters. And I'm a little curious to see how it goes on from here, but I wonder if the payoff at the end of five seasons, if it is them founding the Shire, will that feel worth the journey and the screen time they've been given over those five seasons? Or will we be looking back thinking how much better that runtime would have been spent if it was used on the other stories being told? I'm sure it's partly the absence of the two strongest storylines in my opinion, but this is an episode that just did not resonate with me. We'll see how the back half of season two starts off with episode five next week. Hopefully we'll get back to Anatar, get things feeling back on track, and we can shake this one off. But we'll find out next week. In the meantime, let me know your thoughts. Comment below what you thought of this episode. Do you feel as I did? Do you think I'm off my rocker completely and not caring for this episode? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.